All right, everyone. I think we'll uh, we'll get started. I know there's uh, probably a few more people yeah. on their way. Uh, so welcome uh, to this uh, Lunch and Learn and Dialogue, uh, sponsored by the College of Social and Applied Human Sciences Teaching and Learning Excellence Hub. My name is Byron Sheldrick, and I'm the Associate Dean Academic for the college. Uh, today, um, we're very fortunate to have Kim Anderson, a faculty member in the Department of Family Relations and Applied Nutrition. Uh, here who's going to speak to us about indigenizing the curriculum. Um, I know, I've known Kim for quite a long time now. Uh, she is fantastic and uh, she also has been uh, helping the college in developing its strategy around indigenization. Uh, this is a major plank in the college's strategic plan. Uh, so I think uh, I'm looking forward to the dialogue. I'm going to let Kim say a bit more about herself and take it away. Just before we do one item of business, um, we are, uh, we've realized that as we've done these things, we haven't really tracked who's attended and who hasn't. Uh, and we haven't, as a result, been able to send out uh, requests for feedback. So if you haven't, uh, Chris Donaldson over there has a clipboard that has the lit names of everyone who signed up. Uh, to attend, so if you could, before you leave today, just check your name off. If you didn't sign up, that's fine, you don't have to leave. Uh, we still welcome you. Uh, but just maybe write your name on the, uh, an email on the, uh, on the list so that we can get in touch. And that will also help you, us keep you informed about future events as well, and to seek feedback about this event. So with that, I will just turn it over to Kim. Okay, thank you. So, um, Thank you for inviting me to do this, and Chris for all the work you did organizing. Uh, as Byron said, I'm a faculty member in Fran. I'm a Canada Research Chair, so I have a, um, a smaller teaching world, so I'm not actually, I'm going to talk about the type of teaching I've been doing, but um, I have ha had more limited experience teaching on this campus than uh, the teaching that I did at Laurier, where I was before I came here, where I was teaching in an Indigenous Studies department, which is a totally different project than maybe some of the things we're going to talk about today. I just, you know, we're all running in to have our lunch and like running across and, you know, I flew in my broomstick too, or rather came from uh, the museum um, where I'm doing a shameless plug for uh, an, uh, an exhibit that we're developing for Gulf Civic Museum. Uh, myself and uh, Kara Waycamp, Brittany, Brittany Luby and uh, Chelsea Brandt. And, um, I put this up here, first of all, just because it's kind of like, there I am, the lonely uh, indigenous, uh, identified indigenous faculty member in Seesaws. I think I'm the only one uh, in Seesaws. I was brought in as part of the indigenous cluster hire where they um, brought in six indigenous faculty and deployed us across the colleges. Um, but it can be a, a little bit of work being the only indigenous faculty uh, member in a college and being the one, the go-to person for all that kind of stuff. So I, um, I welcome and honor that, and I think that we also need to have like more of us around to do this kind of thing. So uh, I also put that up there because I think that once we get into talking about what you can do to bring things into your courses, um, one of the easiest things is not not to um, have to uh, look and for resources to bring people in or ask people who are constantly being asked you know, for guest lecturing and so on, but to look at what's going on out there in the community that you can like kind of map in with your um, assignments, map in with your students, get them to use the stuff that's going on, because there's actually a lot of stuff that's going on. So maybe we can talk about that a bit more. And I just highlighted up there <coughs> dialogue in blue because I know a lot of my old friends around here that a lot of you have been thinking and working on this kind of, um, in thinking about this indigenizing curriculum um, piece for a long time. You're committed, you've spent decades in some cases. So I think we could have like a little discussion. Hopefully we'll have some time. I know that we said we're gonna go to 12.30, so we'll, hopefully I'll go through my stuff fairly quickly. We'll have some time to talk. And then if folks need to scuttle and scurry out at 12.30, we'll do that. If people wanna stay and discuss, we can probably go till about quarter to one before we have to like tidy up and get ready for the next group. Is that right, the organizers? Okay, so that being said, I'm gonna start this, uh, this talk with the way in which we start a lot of uh, you know, gatherings. And I'm gonna do it by reading the territorial acknowledgement. So, we acknowledge that the University of Guelph resides on the ancestral lands of the Attawandaran people and the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. 
We recognize the significance of the Dish With One Spoon covenant to this land and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Métis neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we learn and work. So I'll, I'd ask for an honest show of hands of how many people glazed over while I was, while I was doing that. <laughs> you don't have to. You can put up like a little secret one, right? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, OK, the territorial acknowledgment. You know, we've done that piece. Um, we're familiar with it. But I was using this in a class I taught in um, uh, social policy earlier this week in my department. Because what I realized is like a lot of students are familiar with this already. A lot of us are familiar. But it doesn't mean anything. They don't even understand what Haudenosaunee is. Um, and so, you know, the question is, are we being, um, what, are, what are we doing with this? How is it that we're engaging this in terms of uh, wanting to move forward on our projects of indigenization or of decolonization, which is another way that people are saying is really what we need to do. And some of you may have seen uh, Hayden King, who was on uh, CBC or a couple weeks ago or earlier in the um, last week, I think. And he was talking about how he kind of almost regretted writing the one for Ryerson, right? Did anybody see this or, or, or listen to it? Yeah. Did anybody? So, what what are some of the thoughts that you might have had when you were when you were listening to to Hayden when he was talking about this? Yeah. yeah it really resonated because I think that we often don't think about what that compels us to do or what what obligations we might have as settlers and as um, people who have. Um, I guess, and um, taken over some of the responsibilities from these early treaties. And so I like what he was saying, that it's not enough. You have to go one step beyond the territorial acknowledgement into what is that, what's the action that accompanies that. Right, and how do you use it as a framework, not as something that you, 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 know, that you list off, which, uh, like Byron and I were just talking about this. We've had discussions about mixed feelings about it, and I'm not like, don't ever just get up there and read it, don't do it, because I think it does, you know, open up space for discussion. It does position indigenous peoples in a certain place, right? Um, but I think that we need to pay heed to this, and particularly in working with students, because the students, again, they know what it is, but they really don't have any idea about what that means for them. And then sometimes it can cause kind of backlash and so on, right? And you can um, you can feel you can feel that. So he's talking about you know making a commitment and interpreting it doing your own territorial acknowledgement about this is what it compels me to do with the lands that we're on. So I brought this into this classroom. I was teaching this class this earlier this week on social policy. And I started out with the territorial acknowledgement. And I said, if we're thinking about social policy around children, youth, and families, what the heck does that have to do with the territorial acknowledgement and the lands that we're in? And so I started to go through each piece of the territorial acknowledgement, starting with the Attawandaran. And first of all, like who were the Attawandaran, uh, the folks that were here, um, you know, the, 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 the neutral people that were here into the 17th century, the people for whom we, you know, we have um, all sorts of, um, you know, archaeological evidence in this, right here in these lands. So I was trying to th get them to think about that. And I said, you know, they were, if we're thinking about child, youth, and family policy, these are matrilineal peoples, right? Where uh, women lived in longhouse, uh, longhouses, you know, um, multiple families headed by women living in longhouses. Um, and so there was like a certain amount of social capital for women. There was a certain amount of um, focus on children in the next seven generations. So I went through this whole thing trying to talk to the students about what does that actually mean uh, for what you are studying as students in the discipline that we're studying and in this particular course, what does it mean? How do we map on the first part of the territorial acknowledgement, which is about the Attawandaran? And you know, I, I'm not going to go into all my indigenous feminist you know, history and positioning around that, but that's the type of stuff that I would use from the particular engagement that I'm doing and what I'm trying to work with that class and trying to get them to think through that, right? Then I said also, OK, so it talks about the dish with one spoon. We know it talks about the dish with one spoon. What does that mean for where we are in these lands? What are some of the principles that are coming, like some of the ones that Rick Hill, uh, who's a Tuscarora from Six Nations, a magnificent educator. Many of you are familiar with him, I'm sure. Um, 
you know, what does that mean with how he's interpreted the dish with one spoon? And again, I'm not going to go through the whole history of this because part of the exercise is if you don't know, Google it, right? Find out. Go and find out. Go and look. Look for what Rick Hill has actually said and written about this. But again, trying to map it on to the context of the class I was teaching, I was saying to them, okay, so there's these principles about how you only take what you need, you always leave something for somebody else, and you keep the dish clean. What does that mean in terms of social policy for children, youth, and families? How do we start to interpret that and understand that? What does it mean for um, the students? I'm talking to you as a class, right? What does it mean for you as you go out into the world in some of these uh, professions of helping or education or whatever it is, right? For, for students who are studying in my department, uh, family relations and applied nutrition. What does it mean for where you're going? And how do you situ situate yourself in this dish with one spoon that we live in? What does keeping the dish clean mean for children, youth, and families of this territory, right? How do we live by that? And what does it mean in terms of how we have settler and indigenous relationships in these lands? Um, so it's like, again, placing in that territory and trying to understand what that means for where they're going. And then, of course, most, um, I think uh, Brittany Luby, I was, just came out of a meeting with Brittany Luby, our, uh, our um, Anishinaabe professor in the history department, and she said she was reading something about how, like, the majority of young people, they know what indigenous or Indian or whatever is, but they don't actually, couldn't name one nation um, of indigenous people. So, you know, I got into that. I'm like, okay, we're talking about Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Why is that in the territorial acknowledgement? Well, you know, we're in treaty lands of the Anishinaabe. Um, we have this history of um, loyalists coming up after the American Revolution and um, wanting this land, wanting to uh, displace indigenous peoples from these lands because they wanted these territories that we're standing on, working in right now, right? All of our ancestors. So what does that mean? How do you understand that? Um, and what does that mean in terms of the local, do you know where the, the closest local indigenous community is? Or the, the two uh, reserve communities, which are um, Six Nations and New Credit, right? Uh, Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples that are living in those territories an hour away. Right? Do you understand what that means? And what does that mean if you're going to go out and be a teacher in this area? Or what does that mean, again, I'm pitching it, you know, if you're going to be a policy analyst working with children, youth, and families, uh, how, does that, how does that inform um, the, way that you're, the, the way that you're moving forward? So um, at the end, I, was, I asked them to come up with an exercise of like what Hayden King calls us to do, which is write our own uh, territorial acknowledgement, and I didn't, that's like I was teasing these folks, I said, you're in the front row, you're the kids that I'm going to like call on to, to, to say it. But, um, you know, I really encourage them to think about trying to use that as a way of situating themselves. What is it we need to learn? How is it that we're applying to the, to, to the learning that we're doing in this course, in this program, in this context of these lands, at this period in history, and where we're going forward? And that, to me, would be a more useful exercise for the students in thinking through, um, you know, what does it really mean when we're, when we're thinking about indigenization or decolonizing uh, the curriculum, right? And uh, moving forward. So this is um, something that I like to promote a lot of indigenous artists. This is uh, by my friend Christy Belcourt, who's an indigenous uh, Métis artist, and she did her mapping of uh, these lands that we're in thinking about what it means from different contexts. And I think also informing us about how um, we might position ourselves differently around uh, the territories that we're in and where we, where we come from and where we're going, right? So um, I'm going to give you like a minute of silence just to think about um, your discipline, what it is you're teaching, um, who you are, how you're situated here, like what I was asking the students to do, and maybe just jot down like a discussion point or a question that we can get into around how you would do a territorial acknowledgement. And I'm just going to give you a, just a very short period. So just ponder on that for a sec. <clears throat>
So this probably makes for a really boring video for uh, <laughs> the recording. But I think it's good to, uh, I mean, of course we all run around like crazy all the time and we don't actually sit. Carol was saying she was enjoying sitting and just staring into space or thinking, right? Um, and I think it's important to, to think about just sitting with, sitting with what, where we are at in these territories and thinking through that within your own particular personal and professional context, right? Taking the time to be with that. Um, and it, you, you kind of need more than a minute in a crowded room um, and the short time that we have. But I think that if we can do that, it will really help us to think through and to get around the fears that we have around indigenizing our courses, indigenizing the curriculum, right? So I'm not going to wave a magic wand and give you like 100 tips because you can actually find some of those things out there. But, um, but rather invite you to sort of sit with some of these things and, and help, hopefully, help us advocate for maybe further discussion, further things that we're going to do as we move along. So. Um, one of the things that's happening right now, we've had, we've, first of all, we've had Indigenous activity on the campus or organized Indigenous activity on the campus since our beautiful uh, Dr. Kara Waycamp started the um, Aboriginal Students Association in 2001. And we opened the Aboriginal Resource Centre in 2003. Uh, I w I've been around all these years mostly just because I moved to Guelph to get out of Toronto and I was sitting in the library drinking coffee and hey, there's, there's native people on campus. <laughs> and then I end up being a community, I was a community member. So I've been on all sides of the things, but I was a community member in developing the Aboriginal Resource Center, uh, along with Kara, who was a student at the time. Uh, Kara's now the uh, special advisor to the provost on Aboriginal initiatives, and probably most of you know who she is because she's everywhere. And I was, just came out of a meeting with her, and I said, well, I'm going to put your picture up, but I think probably everybody knows who you are, and if they don't, they should because uh, she's pretty central. Um, so anyways, we've had different uh, niches coming along. I wanted to draw your attention to a couple things that are happening right now. One is that, um, of course, with Seesaws, we do have an indigenous, um, indigenous strategy that's part of the strategic, uh, what's it called? Strategic framework, right? Strategic framework. Um, so there's a commitment that's been made in Seesaws as of 2017. We've been uh, rolling along with um, activity, uh, starting with a kind of town hall that I hosted in the fall of 2017. And when I say rolling along, we haven't, we're, we're gonna get to the strategic part of it probably in the spring with a, um, a little retreat. Um, but what's come out of it is we've really been focused on curriculum just because that's, that's what presented itself and that's what we ended up just sort of like starting out on. So um, I'll talk a little bit about the curriculum review and, uh, that we've been doing. There'll be an analysis uh, ready and done by the spring for everybody to read a report about our curriculum review, our college-wide curriculum review. And just uh, heads up that the Aboriginal Initiative Strategic Task Force, which is the campus-wide one, is um, launching right now. And there is a curriculum committee uh, that's chaired by Brian Husband at the moment out of um, College of Biological Sciences. And from our college, Myrna Dawson and, um, oh, it's, yeah, Myrna's on it, and um, Robin Roth are on that committee so far. We're working, we're working along on it. Um, so there are, there are those of us who have been working on curriculum issues, and there'll be more coming up as we go along. Um, just so you have an idea of what the, strategic, what the initiatives task force is going to do, we have five committees. Uh, these committees are populated, haven't met yet, but we will be meeting soon. And it's trying to look at you know, more um, a broader picture of how we can um, both enhance the experience for Indigenous peoples, uh, students and community, community members engaged with campus, as well as bring in more Indigenous ways of learning and knowing, and so on. So we have you know, governance issues, student support, research and scholarship, which I'm chairing, um, campus environment and cultural safety. So that's like, what does the campus feel like, in particular, for Indigenous students? Uh, it's kind of hard to read all this stuff, because it's... Um, not very well, uh, it's too well lit here. But anyway, there is a curriculum and pedagogy committee and that, the stuff that they'll be looking at is um, you know, inclusion of indigenous knowledge and ways of knowing, de curriculum development and so on, right? Support for that, uh, indigenous community engagement and experiential learning, which includes land-based learning. These are where we're starting out. We don't know, you know what we might come up with in, um, as we move along. Um, we're hoping to have like, some kind of like midterm reporting by the fall 
So there'll be stuff that we'll be coming out with by then and you know, maybe in a year's time or so on we'll have a more complete picture of where, it's, where it is we're going as a university. <clears throat> so on to the CSAWS curriculum review. So um, like I say, the CSAWS folk, yay CSAWS, we're like sort of moving along, um, I would say further than the other colleges have done in terms of our strategy uh, at the college level. And um, so coming out of the town hall thing that we did and starting to form a committee, uh, we realized, okay, we need to sort of take a look at the curriculum and see what is going on out there, like just to kind of do a scan and see what's happening in terms of the curriculum. So Olga Smoliak from my department, from Fran, bless her soul, reviewed all of the syllabus, uh, syllabi that she could um, access with, with Chris's help um, through all of the departments. And I don't know if we have any numbers on what she reviewed, but it was, it was, um, it was 1,100, it was pretty, it was comprehensive, bless her soul. She went through that and she had keywords and she was looking for like what she could pull out in terms of what's going on to try to see uh, where, she, where she would find it. Um, we have sent back the results from that at, to each department, to their uh, departmental meetings. So if you haven't, if you were missed that meeting or <laughs> haven't seen it, that came back. What we thought was, okay, that's a first step. And what we found was that there's probably a whole lot more going on, obviously, than what we can just see doing, a, the, doing searches through the syllabi. So we then did a survey, which many of you probably participated in, because you're the ones that are committed and you're here. Um, we, just finished, we just finished that. We had a tremendous response rate, uh, which was really exciting to see. And um, right now we're having a grad student doing an analysis, or we're hiring a grad student to do an analysis of it that will have you know, the picture come out in the spring. But um, one of the things that we found was that uh, people were reporting higher than we, what we saw in the syllabus about having um, indigenous content and pedagogies in your teaching activities, with 59% reporting that. Uh, if you've engaged to integrate, um, have you previously engaged and uh, some people said yes, they had, 23% uh, said yes, they had before. And um, we asked also about research, which I'm not going to focus on particular to today, but of course our research does inform our teaching and if we're doing indigenous research, we feel more confident doing that. Um, so it was, it was um, interesting to see, first of all, the tremendous response rate and also that there is activity going on out there that we need to have discussion. And we'll have more fulsome discussion on that once we have the results and the report. Um, but we asked, you know, okay, um, are you integrating things? And so people came up with things we might expect. They're using readings, indigenous scholarship, or readings about uh, indigenous peoples in terms of case studies, films, videos, all those types of resources, bringing in guest speakers, working with indigenous scholars. Um, it's interesting that people are making use of the TRC a fair bit, which I thought um, is good, right? Because that's what we were hoping would come out of the TRC. And including in that social policy class I taught in last week, there was an exercise to go with the TRC that was, you know, accompany the unit that I was doing. Um, working with local community members, and some folks are using the Aboriginal Resource Centre, which is what I was saying. We found it in 2003. If you don't know where it is, you can go over. It's um, the old federal building. Google it, look it up. Go over there. It's, it's not just an Indigenous student centre. It's there as a resource as well. So you can go and uh, pay a visit and meet Kara. Dr. Wickham's over there. Uh, what we might have expected, people feel unsure. And that's maybe some of the sentiments of people that are here. They don't, maybe some said they didn't feel it was appropriate, worried about being inappropriate, worried about teaching. Um, we've seen backlash um, across the country or with students, uh, you know, um, responding to not having indigenous faculty teaching indigenous course uh, material, right? There has been backlash about that, so we can maybe talk about that. If I can stop talking, we can have a discussion. Um, and in particular, of course, we need resources in order to do this. Um, we need financial resources. You know, I, I, uh, I used to teach um, teachers at Laurier and, you know, of course, we're talking to them about how you have to have indigenous peoples being the theorists, being the ones who are doing this, you know, the teaching and the speaking. And so they'd all come up with their unit plans. Well, I'm going to have elders come to my class. And I said, well, where's the money coming from to pay, <laughs> to pay those elders? Because we ask for a lot, right, from those people that are out there to come and, and do the work of teaching. 
And where's the reciprocity, right? Where is the uh, acknowledgement of what's being given? So we, of course we know that, right? We know that we need resources for that kind of thing. In terms of connecting with local community members as well, you know, when we were doing the task force, I was like, okay, if we're going to have people come to all these meetings, are we going to, you know, pay them to come to those meetings? <laughs> because uh, our local community members, again, with the TRC and indigenization, we're stretched pretty far and wide, and um, we need to recognize that work, right? The labor that's being done by indigenous peoples and the indigenization and TRC fatigue that many of us are feeling at this point, right? Um, so people also talked about, um, you know, therefore having curriculum consultants, curriculum development folks, and scholarly resource centers. I thought that was an interesting suggestion. So people were saying, yes, we have used the Aboriginal Resource Center. There are resources there. There's a library there, which I always tip off students. And I said, if you can't find that seminal text at, at paper writing time that everybody's taken out of the library, go over to the Aboriginal Resource Center because it's not on the system. And it might, be, <laughs> it might be there, right? You'll find a copy there. Um, but yeah, what about that idea about having some kind of um, a resource center that would be more um, directed at curriculum uh, as opposed to the Aboriginal Resource Centre, which is not only for students, but primarily a student space. Um, so all that being said, I don't know how many people here are familiar with this um, article that's getting a lot of um, press uh, by Adam Gudry and uh, Daniel Lorenz from Adam's um, Métis scholar at University of Alberta. And they wrote an article in uh, Alternative or alternative, however you pronounce it, talking about um, what's going on. They interviewed indigenous scholars across the country about their experiences and their thoughts and insights on indigenization uh, and decolonizing. And this is something that you'll see people sort of like um, talk about how um, indigenizing isn't decolonizing. And even when I was at Laurier, we actually had the t-shirts, right? I was trying to dig my t-shirt out this morning, but I couldn't find it. Decol <laughs> Don't indigenize, decolonize. So um, what Gudry and Lawrence pulled out of these interviews that they did with indigenous scholars was they said, OK, well, we think that if we go about this indigenizing pro project in universities, there's kind of like three levels of it. Um, and may, again, maybe it'll be hard to read. But one of them is like inclusion, which is you make space for indigenous students on the campus, but you don't change any of the structures. You don't change the curriculum. You don't change. Um, as, as Rana Kokanen, who's a Sami scholar, wrote in, she wrote a whole book about this in 2007, and she said, we ask indigenous students to check their ontological and epistemological um, positioning at the, at the gates of the university. So they come in, and they're being um, just like you got to you know, assimilate into uh, what's already going on. That's what um, Gudry is saying is inclusion. And then they say reconciliation locates indigenization on a common ground between indigenous and Canadian ideals. Again, as I rattle away on this, I'm, I'm encouraging you to think about your courses, your discipline in particular, about our, our, you know, how are you thinking about or how are you positioning that, right? So are you doing the reconciliation? Are you doing inclusion? Or the decolonization is, they're saying, um, an overhaul and addressing those things that Rana Kokonen has said is like, um, you know, she says, indigenous knowledges and ways of knowing are a real gift to the university, but perhaps they're an impossible gift, she says, um, because of the way the universities are grounded in enlightenment thinking, Western intellectual traditions of rationalism and exclusionary disciplinary boundaries. Those are the things I think that merit deeper thinking as we think about um, our particular disciplines, the classes that we're teaching, and the ways in which we're making space for either indigenization or decolonization in our, in our programs, right, in our departments. Um, how, are, how are we doing that, right? So I'm going to ask you to think about that a little bit. But I'll talk very briefly about what we've done in Fran. So um, as I said, I came in, t I came in and um, quickly became, got a CRC, which means my teaching load, um, I, I have 10% teaching load. I have 30% service because when I came in, I said to the dean, I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be getting like, call, like just everywhere. And I do, I do that. I get, I get calls from all across campus, emails coming in all the time, right? I'm kind of like the mascot of the indigenous scholarly mascot. 
And I also, I said, you know, I want to do that because I'm the only tenured faculty coming in. So I want to kind of mama bear those younger indigenous faculty because I don't want them getting totally overwhelmed and they're up for tenure. And meanwhile, they've done 100 guest lectures and things that are just totally useless in, the, in their TNP. So uh, because um, I have a 10% uh, teaching load, I said, well, instead of me teaching my little, you know, one-off course in fourth year that indigenous families in Canada or something that if whatever, 40, 70 students will take, why don't we look at how I could teach units across the curriculum and we'll scaffold it all the way up. So, you know, starting in first year, we can do that 101, you know, territorial acknowledgement or the residential school lecture, whatever it is those students are needing. And then when you get up into family theory or social policy or whatever in those classes, you know, what, how are you scaffolding the learning? So that's what we're up to right now. We're still working on it. I've done, I started out by just sending out, um, an email to all the faculty in my department. And I'm like, hey, this is what we can do. So if you want me to do a unit, let's talk about it. Knowing, of course, I do have limited time and resources too. So we've, I've sort of just responded to the faculty and working with the faculty that have responded to me. And uh, instead of doing one-off guest lecture, I've tried to make like units. I said I will mark the indigenous content stuff so I can have dialogue with the students directly. I'll take responsibility for the readings. You know, so I'll have my own little, little piece in that course, right? So I've done some of that. I've also done a lot of guest lecturing um, to do that too, because the one-off guest lecturing isn't, you know, it's not a bad thing either. Um, and lots of like people emailing me, oh, you know, I want to do a case study about, um, you know, diabetes research in indigenous community. And so I get on and I'm, I'm Googling stuff too. But I do have, because I've, you know, I've been around for a long time. I know lots of people. I, I've been, you know, I remember, oh yeah, I remember when they started that Ganawage diabetes project, you know, in the 90s back. And so I have a lot of knowledge just because of all the stuff that I've done, right? So I have easier access to find that um, as an indigenous scholar in a certain lens. So I help with that kind of like helping out just identify resources. So really like a curriculum consultant and a kind of a, um, uh, a person that's trying to infuse in a scaffolded way the learning through the program. Who knows if this is the best approach, but it was one that we thought we would try. That approach does require having an indigenous scholar in your department who's able to do that, right? Um, or a curriculum consultant, which is what some um, universities have done. You know, like a, I think the Faculty of Education at Laurier has an act, a full-time curriculum consultant. Some universities have done that, and that's their job, right? Um, are, am I decolonizing? Well, if I think about my own territorial acknowledgement coming into that space, um, I often laugh at the irony because uh, some of you have been into my office, which is on the back uh, side of the McDonald Institute. Uh, the McDonald Institute um, has a particular history around um, the types of education that happened there. And it's interesting to me because, uh, you know, I've been reading lots about the history of home economics. And my um, office was part of the model, model apartment suites on the second floor and the extension they built in the 50s, which was like rotating students through to teach them about the duties of the average housewife. And they, students would come and they would live there for three weeks at a time. They would rotate through laundress, uh, you know, house manager and waitress. I don't know. They were, they were learning the duties of the average housewife, which is, of course, ironic because I'm, I'm a terrible cook. I don't sew. You know, I haven't done any of that since grade seven. And I started doing family studies because I thought, oh, I'm really daunted at this motherhood thing. So maybe I should just be a scholar about it. Maybe I'll be a better <laughs> I study the things I'm really terrible at. And now I teach about it. But um, the irony, I, I'm getting back to that acknowledgement, right? So I sit in that space and I think about what was going on here. And now here I am with my Métis butt sitting in the corner in this home management office. How am I going to decolonize and reverse some of the stuff that was um, part of the project of the particular department program and you know, um, history of where I am? Which includes eugenics, teaching about eugenics, right? Which included sending out matrons, social workers, um, you know, missionaries to indigenous communities, white women, going out and this kind of civilizing project, which was really about breaking down extended and kinship uh, systems that maintained indigenous peoples and kept them healthy in their own lands, right? So there's this whole um, white supremacist um, background 
to where I'm now sitting and where I'm now located in these lands. There's this whole project of like, if you think about the Adewandaran and the matrilineal ways they lived, there was a whole project that's in, that, that my space and the department and everything I'm in was invested in dismantling. And so as I try to think about what am I doing, I'm thinking about how do I begin to um, help students understand that. Thankfully, we're in a time and in a, in a place here that uh, I, have, I have a space like people will allow me to get up and talk about that kind of stuff. I'm very grateful for that. So how do I begin to help students understand that and also understand themselves in the context of like this kind of like civilization or the white savior thing for those that are going to go out and work in helping professions, right? To think through that in a more critical way and to understand the history of what happened in this place, right? And to position themselves accordingly. And then I think about, okay, well, you know, this is place-based learning. What about land? How can we work with land? Like, it's, you got to think about land. It's all about land, right? So we're in a land-rich university. We are very lucky in this university because we have an arboretum space right on the campus. We're so lucky con compared to other universities. So how do we engage with land in terms of the place-based learning? And so we have like gardens going on with uh, Hannah Tate Newfeld, another member in our department, which has to do with indigenous food security for students on campus. Uh, we're working with elders around like land-based learning right here. Uh, we have ceremonial work going on with um, indigenous men and masculinities uh, fires that we're do we started as part of a CIHR grant. Um, and now I have my, uh, my project which we're working on, which is to build a granny's cabin in the Arboretum. Hopefully. Um, so I think about that because I'm like, well, if, um, if it's not about like, oh, you know, land, land and, and where we position ourselves, again, in this territory, yeah, there may be a space in the, for, the, for, for the university to think about uh, like a treaty land entitlement kind of process or giving lands uh, back to the, back to the, the Anishinaabek. That's a, that's a project, right? But in the meantime, there's all sorts of other stuff we can do to re-engage and reawaken and work with students around land. So that's what, um, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm thinking about, right? And as I think about that, I think about who are the people that lived here, what kind of traditions do they come from, what's my department doing, what's the college doing, how do we refocus all of that to sort of like decolonize uh, what has gone on in the past, right? So um, <clears throat> there's like... Um, these, there's, a, there's a list, you can again Google it, probably a lot of you have seen it, that Shawnee and Pete did at the University of Regina on 100 ways to indigenize and decolonize academic programs and courses. And she's divided it up for like what deans can do, what faculty can do, and so on. Um, it is contextual. We always have to think about what place we're in. Again, getting back to the territorial acknowledgement, right? Who are we? Where are we? What, is these, what are these lands? But what also is the University of Guelph? in terms of our strengths and in terms of what we can offer. Um, so this one comes out of University of Regina, which of course is a very different place when you're talking about settler indigenous relations, uh, all sorts of stuff. It's culturally, it's different. But she does have um, some um, important ones that I just pulled out because I thought they're good in terms of discussion. So uh, that's the first one is what I'm thinking about. Know the territory you're in. Think about your own territorial acknowledgement and how you might um, encourage students to do that. Not that we want them to do the same exercise in every class, but um, you know, thinking about that. Um, identifying the long-term benefits of indigenization for your students and your profession. Again, it's the gift, right? It's a gift. It's not, um, it's not, a, it, sh it's not it shouldn't feel like um, this chore or this heavy-handed thing that's coming down. And I think that, um, you know, Disrupting the dominant idea of deficit thinking is really important. So that what we're doing is not like, you know, teaching our students about the plight of indigenous peoples all the time or about how dispossessed and, uh, you know, poor and, and beaten up we are. Because uh, whereas those things are true and they need to be told within certain contexts and within certain stories, they tend to have been the dominant story, which does nothing for positioning people as theorists as opposed to positioning us as, uh, as subjects. And so, you know, case studies and all that kind of stuff are a good thing. But what I try to do with the students, and it's also kind of more fun and more groovy if they can see some of the genius of uh, what Rana Kokanen is saying gets left at the door, 
the ontological and epistemological um, ways of knowing, you know, those ways of knowing, right? Indigenous, the indigenous ways of knowing. Um, so if you seek out and review scholarship by and about indigenous peoples in your field, that's some, you know, homework. I think this is an interesting one. Develop a departmental statement about why indigenous content and pedagogies are important to the program and the discipline. Because I think if students um, aren't introduced to this, similar to like if they aren't introduced to what the heck is the territorial acknowledgement, what does it have to do with me, um, then, they, then they resist more, right? Because they don't understand. So for us, maybe it's, um, you know, well, why, you know, why are we studying indigenous ways of knowing in a department of family relations and applied nutrition? Well, you know, first of all, <clears throat> there's this big thing called child welfare, which is, you know, problematic. But also, there's all these uh, uh, traditions that we can look at of uh, non-heteropatriarchal non traditions that can help us to inform and think about how we might envision uh, where we're going, right? So um, actually, Linda Ashburn had said this about how maybe we need to think about um, how we can commit to why we, why we would do that. What's the gift? What do we learn from that? And how does it s help to situate our students within where they are and where they might be going after they, after they leave here, right? Um, one thing that's um, really important is preparing responses to student questions about the level of Indigenous content. And maybe we can have a quick discussion about that too. But there is typically, um, not typically, it has been um, common across the country to have backlash to introducing Indigenous content. Or why is there, there's too much Indigenous content? Or why this, I didn't think this was going to be a history class or whatever, right? There's a range of it. Some of you that have been doing this know uh, how, that, um, how that works. And I think anticipating and preparing responses to racism, especially um, helping your TAs n n like work with that. I've heard uh, faculty talking about that and about how do they prepare uh, their TAs or help them to respond to those types of things because they, um, they might not be, right? Um, so considering off-campus and land-based learning things, land, language, and social relations, right? How do we help to um, work those things in from a non-deficit-based approach to be able to give that gift to our students, right? And what I say to the students, like when I was uh, teaching in the family theory or the social policy, I said, okay, I'm talking about indigenous context, but um, it's there for you to think about and perhaps translate it into other types of contexts, right? So it's applicable in a, in, a broader, in a broader scheme. And having to talk to them about that because maybe you know, they don't put it together or they feel um, resistance. So uh, these, these folks, some of you probably know their writing. Linda Tuhi Weissmith is, uh, of course, she wrote the seminal work on um, decolonizing indigenous research methodologies. And um, Graham Hengangaroa Smith is um, her husband. They are Maori uh, uh, and have uh, from Aotearoa, and they have done a tremendous amount of work in post-secondary as well as uh, um, earlier education around uh, indigenizing the academy, for lack of a better word. And I put them up there just because um, they're kind of like the grandparents of a lot of us internationally. Uh, and I put, um, I wanted to have a picture of Graham when I tell a story about how I was in a conference last summer. And he was, you know, sitting as just a, he was just listening to the presenter. And the subject came up about how people were feeling really, um, they were really struggling with the resistance they were meeting. Uh, and in terms of particularly untenured faculty or people that are more worried about course evals, because it's a real thing, uh, uh, that the students were saying, you know, they were, they were having negative responses. And Graham, like I say, he's like the granddaddy of us all. He says, well... The way I see it, you know, if you're not getting, you know, some negative feedback, then you're not doing your job, right? <laughs> he was telling this, this young scholar that was uh, struggling with it, a settler scholar. Um, but I guess we need to think about that um, not only among our students, but within our departments, within our college, and within the university in general. You know, there is language out there like, oh, that's bringing in more of that Aboriginal hocus pocus. Things like that are said. Uh, nobody says it to my face. But I know that that kind of stuff is out there. So how do we start to position ourselves around what is it that we're offering as a gift? Um, and you know, I guess I just I just like to have these two up there because they make me feel strong, and they make me realize that um, all sorts of things can be are possible. Right. So 
I wanted to leave just a couple minutes. Maybe I'll just put these up here and ask people for any questions or any feedback around some of these ideas. Again, it's not like I, ha you know, I have like 40 minutes and, a, and you cram in a pizza and like, okay, we're, you know, we got it, right? Uh, <laughs> and a couple Timbits, right? A couple Timbits and we're ready to go, right? Um, this is a long-standing and ongoing project and it's also, uh, you know, colonization too is a long-standing and ongoing project. And so um, it's something that we, I think, need to like continue to, to dialogue about and to find ways to do it within the resources that we have and to call upon those ones that we need. So I'll just open it up for any um, comments on any of these or questions or anything you want to, to raise. And I guess you have to talk into the mic, do you? Because yeah, we're recording. Pass the mic, maybe? Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Kim, for a, a wonderful talk. Like I think, um, wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that this is one of the best talks I've been to at this or any other university in years, and, oh, and really gotten a lot out of it. And I think, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Um, I guess my question relates. That there's two parts to it. Um, one concerns language, mm -hmm. and the other concerns the study and work with indigenous communities outside of Canada. Right. Um, and with language, I, I, I really appreciate your comments about sort of thinking critically about the, the colonial imprint and legacy that, that still sort of shapes the way in which we think about language and land and, and social relations. I'm wondering whether the university or the college even has gotten into discussions about incorporating indigenous languages into the curriculum, and if so, where that might be going. And then second, I'm, I'm sort of a newcomer to um, working with indigenous scholars, mainly in the, the Andean region. Uh, I'm working with a, a scholar in Ecuador um, who's Quechua, Quechua speaking uh, uh, Ecuadorian scholar. And uh, I'm wondering too, like, like where do indigenous um, peoples outside of the North American context fit into this, this discussion here on campus? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so first, the question about language. There is uh, an Anishinaabe language course starting, I believe, through, through College of Arts um, in, I don't know if anybody knows more, in, next fall, I think. Yeah, I went to one of Tara's lunch and learns, and she said it was in the works, and they were hoping for fall 19. Fall 2019. Um, so, and we, we decided to start, well, not we, I mean, we, there's been discussions going on, I think, because um, Mohawk is being taught at other local universities. so. That's, you know, and maybe that's our bias, some of those of us that <laughs> work around with Anishinaabek. So there's a language. There's also, I have a research project, a SHRC project. Um, some of you talked to my who's going around interviewing people about um, how do we do extracurricular or just everyday language on campus. So we're starting to do activities like about how that might become part of the everyday living because people talk about how, for example, um, like in New Zealand, they, they name buildings and whatever. It becomes part of the you know, the discourse of the campus. Um, so we have our first, we have our Mishomas, our, um, the only fluent language speaker, uh, Anishinaabe language speaker in, uh, in town that I know of, whose uh, name is Shaki, and we're gonna do, um, like we're gonna do a live uh, language, lived place-based language tour coming up in a few weeks um, for students. So there's this stuff that we're, we're trying to figure out how do we start to do that kind of thing. As far as um, international, we had a lot of debate about that when we were doing the survey. Uh, because we were, we, and, and we've had a lot of debate about that, about like are we talking about, you know, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, or are we talking about internationally? And we've kind of erred on the side of local and, and um, you know, within the, within the Canadian context. Um, but I think that doesn't mean that we can't have like discussions about um, how international things can inform, you know, uh, what gift do they bring, how do they inform, how can we like kind of have those types of conversations. Because there is, of course, internationally, indigenous peoples have all sorts of forums and like ways in which we engage internationally with each other. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure. But I think we thought, you know, we really do need to be thinking about this territory and what does it, 
what does it mean, right? And for the students, like or whatever, in social policy or whatever, okay, you know, they're going to work with um, in co in Canadian context. So that's part of it. But th that's my response. I'm not sure. It's a little furry, like how we've been talking about it. But we have it on the side of. Is that is that right? Am I sort of saying it right? I think so. Well, anyway. I think We're, when we're thinking about the context of truth and reconciliation, that 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 there are sort of special issues that we need that we need to be addressing that are based on the the Canadian history. I mean, it is yep. land based here too, so um, there's there's maybe sort of a continuum too that we recognize the, some of the commonalities of Indigenous experiences and oppressions across the world. Um, but as people in this place and in this land with a specific history of this country, there we, we need to, to pay a special attention to those, I would, I don't know that's how. That's right, I remember, that's the discussion we had in our Indigenous strategy meetings, right? So I was looking at Mavis, I'm like, is that what we were talking about? But yeah, that was it, <laughs> but TRC. But I think that m there might be opportunities for like more, like I say, dialogue and engagement um, internationally, so. Other brave souls. As you're talking, I keep thinking about the, the, the how, situating myself as a learner. And so I'm just wondering, in terms of support for your colleagues or in the future on campus, how are we going to, or have there been conversations around how we will be co-learners with our students? Mm. around this? Well, that's an interesting kind of curriculum question, right? Like, I, I think one of the things I, I um, advocate, um, if we don't have resources and we don't want to burn out those speakers that are around the community members, is like I say, uh, and this is on one of my, my to-do lists, which is way over here, but maybe look, we'll work on that, is coming up with lists of stuff that's going coming up. Like, there's an art... There's an art gallery exhibit opening on March 8th, right, which a bunch of us have curated. So can you go there with your students? Is there some way you can think about co-learning? And I, what, what, we, what I've found is that students, uh, you need to build it into the curriculum. Uh, of course, we can't like mandate them to go to something, but you can say, OK, you can do this, or you can go on your own time to this uh, you know, free event or whatever, and you write a reflection paper. Or you can do like. Um, I used to do this at Laurier, you know, you can do 20 hours of volunteer work with the, uh, the greenhouse on the reserve, which we would do as we had it built into the curriculum. And then I give you like a certain percentage of your mark so that we build it actually right in and then you use what's already going on. And maybe there's ways, like creative ways, that'd be cool to see about how you can talk about co-learning. And I think, you know, lots of times people feel really insecure and uncomfortable, like positioning themselves as some kind of expert. And I used to tell the teachers um, when I was teaching um, primary school teachers uh, mostly, I said, well, you know, you're not going to position yourself as coming as some kind of expert or that this is your, what you know, but you can talk about, this is what I learned. Like, this is who I am. This is what I learned. And, you know, this is what I can kind of try to share with you from what I learned. And then you bring in those resources to help with that, right? So, um, but getting out and doing stuff with your students as a part of a co-learning um, exercise, I think, could be a really um, creative thing that students would respond to, I think. Carol? Um, uh, so I just really had something to add to the last one when Craig was um, talking. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I, that I have found um, in teaching um, to students over the years in political science courses is that there is this sense that um, it's not here, it's over there. Right. And I think that's another reason why the approach um, that you're taking is so important, really important. Yeah, absolutely. And I've actually, I'm trying to, I'm even getting more and more narrow in my focus now. I'm right down to the campus and right down to my office. Like I've come out from all this stuff that we do out there and I'm trying to figure out how do we zero right in right here right now and into the future, right? 
I definitely, I um, use the McDonald College example when I do my gender and politics, right? So I do quite a bit on that. And um, also use the example when we get into the sexuality part of it, of the psychologizing, the Western way of, of doing things um, compared to indigenous ideas of spirituality, et cetera. So um, I think it's an, uh, um, it's important for students to really think about that locally, and and I try to bring that in too. Mm -hmm. And it's in there every day, right? Which is what we're trying to do with the language too. Actually, the language thing we're doing, we're, we've got a Made in Guelph project because um, what our elder told us was, he said, language sits in place. He's from um, Treaty 3, he's from Northwestern Ontario, and he says, like, I can't teach you without being out in that context, but what we're going to do is we're going to go around the campus and we're actually going to make language in this place that helps the students to think about it. It's live, it's futuristic, it's part of who we are, and it's like, what does Rosansky mean from the interpretation through the language of this um, Anishinaabe, Anishinaabe elder, right? And try to get like that ownership and, uh, again, it's a living thing, right? So. I'm aware that it's after 12.30, so I, wanna, I know people probably have to scurry to other meetings, but if people want to keep talking, maybe we can go for another couple minutes with questions, and if you need to leave, please, please feel free to do so. <clears throat> or maybe we all want to leave. Thank you again, Kim. I was going to, this is sort of thinking out loud, um, in the spirit of Googling it ourselves, I'm wondering if... <clears throat> we as settler scholars could collaboratively participate in creating some kind of a repository of resources, um, readings, field trip sites, et cetera. And I'm wondering maybe if the um, Teaching and Learning Excellence Hub would be a good place within Seesaws to house that. Yeah, that's a great idea. There, there, there was a community of practice. There have been little like groups along the way who formed around stuff. But I think maybe making a, a larger repository and have things like Films you can show in class or different, you know, that would that's a good idea. So we'll put that one down. I think Gwen has something to to say about that. Uh, I would just say I think that's a great idea, and uh, but I'm, I'm I'm sure Byron can work on that. I actually just had one one comment and thought um, in a bit of a different way. And it goes back to my own experience. I remember teaching a community nutrition course and you know, having the students read an article about the Sandy Lake Diabetes and Health Project and, and, and suddenly having this realization that I was teaching this from, the per, from a perspective that kind of assumed that everybody in the class was a settler. Right. And it suddenly occurred to me, how would I feel if I was an in indigenous student sitting in this class the way I was framing it? And, and as, as, you know, as I guess thinking about indigenous strategy for the university and the college, one of our goals would be you know, to make this feel like a, 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 a better home or a safer place for aboriginal students. Uh, and uh, if we are successful in that, in getting Aboriginal students to come here, how can we, in our indigenization and talking about these issues, do it in a way that feels okay to to them? I don't know if you have any comments. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, like again, I remember when I was teaching at Laurier Branford, which is right next to Six Nations, of course, and you had students and it's their territory and it's kind of like, so you have to find ways of speaking that you are speaking to people and also not assuming that the indigenous students will be the experts because that's what happens. Even though we say it over and over again, it happens still. It just keeps coming up where the indigenous students get called upon to be the expert in class. And it's, it can be, um, well, first of all, who wants to be, you know, as a student, that's not your job to be the expert. But also it can be a shaming thing because many of our students are dispossessed of their, um, you know, their, their epistemologies and ontologies. And so um, we have to be mindful of that in sort of helping them to explore and discover and take ownership while not, you know, singling them out or... So I would never, like in class, I would never really acknowledge who was Indigenous and who wasn't. I would speak assuming that I had, and well, I knew I had, like, always uh, a portion of Indigenous students in the class. Um, but that's a big question that I think we need to think, like, we need to, to flag, right, and ponder as we go forward. But when you read all these things about what to do, it's always like on the list, never ask an Indigenous student to, for their opinion on something or whatever. Um, that's the worst thing you can do, right? So, yeah.
just thought, following up on the uh, comment about resources, I mean, it strikes me in terms of, um, uh, in light of some of the ways that you've been talking about this, Kim, I mean, those kinds of projects about finding resources could also be a, a curriculum-based project that yeah. happens in our classroom so that we're learning together, we're taking responsibility, we're building it together as a, you know, so that can be a very active experiential learning kind of thing to do. For sure. Which involves everybody and does it now. and Or get the students to do the homework about what, what are some of the um, activities that are going on this semester uh, in town or on campus. Uh, we have Aboriginal Awareness Week every fall, so there's a whole week. It's easy to put one of those um, things on your, on your syllabus and ask them to go and reflect on it or whatever, whatever you want to do. Right? Um, we might have time for one more comment or question, if anyone has one. I don't see one. So, um, Kim, I, I, I really, uh, this has been a fabulous talk. I agree with Craig, w uh, just incredible. And I also agree with you that we can't just have a few Tim bits and talk <laughs> and then it's all solved. So I, I'd like to suggest that, in fact, this is the start, I, I would hope, Mm -hmm. about these issues and about how we think about our teaching, how we think about our curriculum, uh, that the Teaching and Learning Hub, I hope, will, will help to foster it, it, that ongoing conversation and discussion over the next, uh, next for however long as it years. takes. 500 <laughs> years, absolutely. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, Kim, and thank everyone in the audience who came and took time on a windy and blustery day to come out and uh, share lunch and, uh, and listen to the talk and participate in the discussion. It's been fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.